This version of the 2018 HPA Tech Retreat Technology Year in Review was recorded after the presentation. I've removed the event introduction material, but I've restored some data that was removed intentionally for quizzes. So let's start with old media. This is a New York Times technology correspondent, Farhad Manju, and he says, welcome to the post-text future. And he's somebody whose business is based on text. But is it really a post-text future? Here's a story in Forbes about how the New York Times is not failing, uh, strong profits and 2.3 million digital subscribers. Well, digital subscribers are not quite the same as paper subscribers, but here's a story from Recode about how Wired is still putting out a print magazine, not how, but why they're still putting out a print magazine in 2018. And uh, the editor was asked, will Wired be putting out a magazine in a year? Yeah, absolutely. Here's something from The New Yorker, a fascinating story about why paper jams persist in this age of digital information. Um, it's a free link, at least at the moment. So let's get into some other media, television. Here is a comparison of household TV sources in 2015 with those in 2017. And two takeaways are, even though there's a cord cutting trend that you can see there, there are fewer households with no TV. So more people watching TV in 2017 than 2015, and more households with over-the-air antennas, which sounds boring if you call it that, but if you call it wireless TV, it sounds exciting. Uh, how about cathode ray tubes, picture tubes? Here's a story that ran in The Verge about why CTL Electronics is restoring CRT-based monitors and TV sets. Uh, it's for gaming because it eliminates the lag associated with LCD TVs. And uh, for those of us in the opera business, we're also using CRT monitors for the singers to look at the conductor. Uh, we're going to hear from Pete Putman in a little while about what was introduced at CES this year, but here's an interesting story in USA Today saying, uh, here's a secret about CES, few of the products see the light of day. And one product that I thought was kind of interesting was an internet-connected shower. Hmm. But then I found this story on the web about an e-shower, and uh, it was posted in 2015. Now you're going to hear from the broadcasters panel about ATSC-1, or it was originally just called ATSC, versus ATSC-3. Uh, the big advantage to ATSC-3.0 is it's adjustable. You have an adjustable bit rate from less than ATSC-1 to more than ATSC-1. The signal-to-noise ratio is adjustable also, which means that you can uh, give up bit rate in favor of, say, having a signal robust enough to watch on a mobile device. And you can have up to four variable pipes, so you can be feeding some content to a mobile device while you're using a higher bit rate to deliver, let's say, uh, ultra high definition to a home theater setup. And there's many codings allowed, and it was authorized late last year. But the transition is going to be very different. The transition from analog to ATSC was government mandated, and the government even provided funds so that viewers could buy adapters. Every broadcaster was given a second channel to do the transition, and reception was mandated in TV sets. Uh, for ATSC3, at least at the moment, it's only government permitted, and uh, that sort of means that broadcasters have to get together and all put their signals on one station of one form of transmission um, to allow for the transition to happen, and that reliance on that station is required for five years, and some stations have been petitioning the government for waivers about that, and reception is voluntary, so the TV set manufacturers don't necessarily have to make TVs that have ATSC3 reception. Meanwhile, the era of peak TV continues. 487 scripted shows in 2017. Uh, well, that's scripted shows, and scripted shows you would think you could just stream anytime, and yet, according to this story in Advanced Television, 75% of us have skipped a social event to watch TV. 
well, there are some live events on TV, and the number one of those is always the Super Bowl, and every year I talk about that, so let's talk about Super Bowl 52. By conventional TV measurement, it had 103.4 million viewers. That's down 7% from 2017, and 2017 wasn't the peak one. That was down from 2015. And yet, even with that loss of 7%, it still ranks in the top 10 of U.S. TV audience of all time. Uh, Nine of the 10 are Super Bowls. Now, it was also the most streamed Super Bowl ever uh, in... Uh, average minute audience, 2.02 million. You may see some other figures for peak viewership. But even that was up 17% over 2017, and that was up 23% over 2016. But even with that, and even with a 7% smaller conventional TV audience, the streaming is not yet 2% of the conventional TV audience. And new this year, there was a measurement of -of out-of-household viewing, which added another 12 million viewers, say people in bars or something like that. Uh, Brought the total viewership up, although we don't know what the out-of-household viewers were in other years. Um, Streaming, another issue, according to Parks Associates, 20% of streamers are sharing credentials. And that's not good if you want to make money from streaming. Um, Last year, I put up this top left thing about how Amazon's Alexa started ordering people doll's houses after hearing its name. Well, this year, uh, there was an Alexa ad in the Super Bowl, and so there's a story down at the bottom right about how uh, Amazon made sure that its devices wouldn't react to hearing their name on the Super Bowl. But that was just for the uh, Amazon ad. Um, Here's an interesting one. The box office for Black Panther has been setting records, um, and this is wonderful, but one of the themes this year seems to be artificial intelligence and big data. Well, if you analyze the big data of successful movies over time, no one would have green-lighted Black Panther. It's a story about a black hero directed by a black director, um, takes place in a um, country in Africa for much of it. Um, The cast is black. All of those things did not spell box office success previously, and yet this is a tremendously successful movie. Uh, Still, the movie industry, you know, maybe they're staying steady, maybe they're growing a little bit, maybe they're going down a little bit, but they're definitely not growing tremendously. So AMC is talking about adding virtual reality experiences to the movie theaters. Meanwhile, Paramount has come up with the opposite, They're saying that um, they're planning to launch a virtual reality movie theater. So the experience that people have of going to the movies and being in a crowd, you can do that by wearing a virtual reality headset and watching the movie in what seems to be a movie theater experience. And you can even chat before the movie. Um, Also, augmented reality and virtual reality groups have created the first global virtual reality day, November 18th, so mark your calendars. If you want more information about virtual reality, Pornhub seems to have a tremendous amount of data about uh, virtual reality. But that may sound good, yet Nokia has killed off its virtual reality camera, which was one of the exciting uh, features of virtual reality recently. So... Hmm. Uh, Meanwhile, back in the movie theaters, um, we are starting to see direct view cinema, and there's going to be a discussion of that this afternoon. Is it necessary? Well, um, maybe you can achieve the same kind of contrast without going to direct view. Is it good? Hmm. Maybe it changes the cinema experience in ways that you don't necessarily like. Security. In past retreats, there were people that we had who were telling us about what we were doing wrong. Well, it turns out that even if you didn't do anything wrong, Meltdown and Spectre had uh, access to your data. And we see that smart TVs can, can be hacked. And, well, do we really care about that? Well, most TVs are now Internet connected, so maybe we do. And users got locked out of their Google Docs for no good reason uh, because they thought they were doing something bad. Let's talk a little bit about new technologies, uh, some applications for artificial intelligence, improving fake news. And I highly recommend this URL, futureoffakenews.com, and listening to the long report that they have there. 
Here's a story in the New York Times about um, President Trump saying at one time that the Access Hollywood tape was real, and now he's not so sure, well, because of things like Adobe Voco and other things shown in that future of fake news. And we'll have a story about detecting fake video uh, on Friday that I highly recommend. Um, AI may also be used to reduce buffering. Yes, buffering is still a problem in streaming video. In acquisition, we have lensless single pixel cameras and even one that can capture 3D from a single standpoint. You see that video of the leaves kind of rotating. Well, the leaves were not rotating in the original. The camera wasn't moving and it didn't even have a lens. There's a new version of a stacked color sensor and nanotechnology is giving us both blacker blacks and more transparent transparent materials. Uh, IBM has uh, come up with the possibility of a bit per atom in storage, so we still have a long way to go in storage, but we're going to hear some very interesting things later about the possible use of blockchain for storage and uh, blue light control. We now have so many screens delivering uh, so much blue light that um, we need to try to do something about that, and uh, that's what is being shown here. We can still provide color and yet get rid of the blue light that seems to be keeping people up at night. And finally, uh, there's augmented reality now for people who don't want to necessarily look dorky with uh, items like the Intel Vaunt. Thank you for listening.